Welcome to the Port of San Diego Employee Orientation. This video training was developed for all new employees coming to work in any San Diego shipyard. Whether you will be working at one of the three major private shipyards, NASCO, BAE Systems, or Northrop Grumman Continental Maritime, or at the 32nd Street Naval Station, North Island, or Point Loma, this video will explain basic policies and practices that are used by all contractors in every shipyard. Every organization has written rules and policies on safety, ethics, security, work rules, and employee training. Your employer will provide you with a company handbook on their general policies. Be aware that your employer's handbook and this video are not a complete guide to every requirement in the workplace, and they are not guarantees of any specific treatment toward any employee. There are only guidelines to help you understand what is expected of you. You must consult all of your employer's published rules and policies to determine specific rights and responsibilities. You can always ask your supervisor if you have any questions. Every employer must comply with the Equal Employment Opportunity Laws. These will be posted at your employer's site for everyone to view. Every employer is also committed to providing a drug-free workplace. This means that each employer may require drug testing of any employee. Drug testing may occur before you begin employment, at random intervals, and at any time an employee is involved in an accident. Be aware that using illegal drugs or consuming alcohol at work is never allowed. It is also not allowed for any employee to report to work while under the influence of illegal drugs or alcohol. Violators will be disciplined with possible suspensions or termination. Harassment of any kind is not permitted in any workplace. Every employer has rules against any form of harassment, including fighting or bullying, threats or intimidation, and sexual harassment. If you are subjected to or a witness of any harassment in the workplace, please report it immediately to your supervisor or the Human Resources Department. If you have any questions about the policies of your company, either look them up or ask your supervisor or Human Resources representative. As a shipyard employee, you may often work at off-site locations. This may be a prime contractor's yard, at a naval facility, or at a commercial pier. If you work at a site other than your employer's facility, all of your company rules and policies still apply. In addition, you must also comply with the rules of the facility you are at. Many of the rules at these facilities are basically the same. When you work at an off-site location, the safety personnel at that yard or on board a ship have the right to stop you from unsafe practices. If anyone from another organization stops or questions you about safety, be courteous and comply with their demands. Violation of safety or security rules at an off-site location may result in penalties. Personnel at the host facility have the right to ask your name if they see you doing something unsafe. They will report any violations to your employer and may take actions such as barring you from working at their facility. Whether you are working at your own facility or off-site, one major concern for everybody today is security. Nearly every shipyard handles military vessels from the Navy, Military Sea Lift Command, or the Coast Guard. Security of these ships is vital. We'll talk more about security on board military vessels later in this video. Right now, we'll explain the basic requirements for security and entry into the shipyards and military bases. Every employer must provide each employee with a picture ID badge. A picture ID badge is required for every person entering a shipyard or naval station. Once inside any facility, you must wear your badge on the outside of your clothing, preferably in the chest area. Badges must be worn at all times inside the facility. If you lose your badge, you must report it to your supervisor immediately. Never under any circumstances should you use another person's badge. Also, never allow anyone else to wear your badge. Using false identification is a serious offense and may result in suspension or termination. We've all heard about the threat of terrorism. It should be obvious to everyone by now that you should never bring firearms, knives, or explosives into any facility. Your toolboxes, bags, and vehicles may be searched whenever you enter the yard. You should also know that cameras are not allowed unless you have a camera permit. Terrorists have been known to take pictures before an attack, and any shipyard or military base will not allow unauthorized cameras in their facility. What you may not know is that cell phones with camera capability are also considered cameras and are strictly prohibited. If you have a cell phone with a camera, you must never bring it into any shipyard or naval facility. 
only authorized vehicles are allowed to enter the facility. Most shipyards do not have parking inside the facility for private vehicles. Because of terrorist threat, all vehicles that do enter shipyard or naval facility are subject to search. Do not bring unauthorized equipment or materials. Most of the rest of this video is dedicated to the safety practices. There are training segments on emergency response procedures, personal protective equipment, housekeeping, hand and power tools, hazardous material communication, confined space entry, lockout tagout, cranes and yard equipment, work on military vessels, hot work, and environmental requirements. This video training is an overview of these requirements. Your employer will make available copies of their full written policies and procedures. Please read them thoroughly. If you have any questions, always ask your supervisor. There is a potential hazard on board any vessel wherever employees enter confined spaces. A confined space is any space with limited access and a potentially hazardous atmosphere. They include all tanks and voids, as well as any other space that is normally closed up. There is a very special danger within all of these spaces. They could kill you without you ever knowing it. Please listen closely as we explain how to stay safe whenever you work in confined spaces. The main danger from confined spaces is that they may have atmospheres that will not support life. Because of their limited access, the air does not circulate and the oxygen levels may be too low. In addition, confined spaces might also have toxic chemical fumes and may even be explosive. The first step in keeping you safe is for you to be able to identify a confined space. On board ships, you can assume that the following areas are confined spaces. Fuel tanks, water tanks, void tanks, holding tanks, chain lockers. Anytime you are going through a bolted hatch or cover, you are entering a confined space. If you have any doubts about entering any space, always check with your supervisor. The primary threat from confined spaces is that the oxygen level may be too low to support life. Inside these spaces, the oxygen mixes with the steel as it forms rust. The rusting process depletes the oxygen level. Because the space is confined, Air does not circulate enough to replenish the oxygen. Over time, the oxygen can become so low that the air will no longer sustain life. What makes this hazard so dangerous is that you can't see it and you can't smell it. You have no way to sense if the oxygen is low. A second potential problem in confined spaces is the residual contents that could contain toxic or irritating elements such as fuel or hydrogen sulfide. A third potential problem in confined space is the possibility that the atmosphere is explosive. This is most likely in fuel tanks and tanks that had volatile chemicals in them. So how do you make sure you don't become a victim? How can you be certain a confined space is safe before you enter it? Each employer or prime contractor has a shipyard competent person who tests the atmosphere of each space every day. They will post both a marine chemist certification and a daily update log at each entry location. This will tell if the space is safe for entry and safe for hot work. Before you enter any confined space, you must first check the update form and verify that it has been certified as safe for entry or safe for workers within the past 24 hours. If you will be doing hot work, you must also verify that the space is certified as safe for hot work. If these certifications are current within the past 24 hours, you may proceed into the space. In San Diego, contractors use a unique color-coded confined space logging system. The color of the update form will signal the status of the space. Green means that the space is safe for workers and safe for hot work. Yellow means that the space is safe for workers and for limited hot work. Orange means safe for workers but not safe for hot work. Red means not safe for workers and not safe for hot work. Blue means that you must enter with restrictions such as special equipment but no hot work is allowed. Tan means that the space is not safe for entry of workers, but hot work is allowed because the space or tank is filled with inert gas. 
Each update form will have a line for each separate day and you must check that the last update was within 24 hours. If the update form is not current, you must not enter the space. Stop and tell your supervisor. Be sure to read and follow all instructions on the form. For example, if the form states that ventilation is required, you must have adequate ventilation in the space before you can enter. There may be other conditions or warnings on the form. Be sure to read them and follow all requirements. Even if a space has been updated as safe, things could change inside the space and make it dangerous. That is why you need to be aware of the symptoms of danger. If you are in a space that has low oxygen, you will become dizzy, lightheaded, or winded. These are the first warning signs that the oxygen is too low. If you feel these symptoms, immediately leave the space. Don't wait until it is too late. Have everyone exit the space and get the competent person to retest it right away. Also, if you smell any strong chemical or fuel vapors, immediately stop all hot work and evacuate the space. Locate the competent person and have them retest the space to verify that it is safe. If you see any valves or piping begin to leak into a confined space, immediately evacuate and get a competent person to test again. Also, notify your supervisor and get the leak fixed. Before you enter any confined space, your supervisor will instruct you on how and where to report emergencies that happen in confined spaces. Do not enter any confined space unless you know what to do if an emergency happens. There are confined spaces on every ship. Any space or tank that is normally sealed up must be tested and certified before anyone can enter into them. To keep yourself and others safe, check the color-coded update form that it indicates safe for entry or safe for workers. Check to see that the form has been updated within the last 24 hours. Check that the space is certified safe for hot work before you perform any hot work. Make sure that all listed requirements such as ventilation, respirators, lighting, etc. are in use as required. Know what to do in case of an emergency. If you see liquids leaking, smell unexpected odors, or feel dizzy or lightheaded, evacuate the space immediately and have it retested by a competent person. Because they are so dangerous, confined spaces deserve your respect. Never take any chances with your life. If you have any questions, always ask your supervisor. When you work in a shipyard, there is always a chance for an injury or an accident. We hope that none of these ever happens to you, but this segment will describe what everyone should know in case they do. Each employer will have specific instruction that give more detail on how you should handle emergencies, injuries, and accidents. You should consult your employer's instruction for complete details. Emergencies include major accidents with injuries where immediate attention is needed, large fires or explosions, earthquakes or tsunami warnings, bomb or terrorist threat. Responding quickly and correctly can help keep a bad situation from getting worse. In the event of either an injury or a fire, immediately get help. At NASCO, the yard phone emergency number is 911. You can also call on your cell phone to 544-8777. At BAE Systems, the number for all emergencies is 3333. This will call security 24-7. You can also call 2222 for the medical department or 5555 for the safety department. At CMSD, the emergency number is 218, which will contact the security gate. If you are on board a ship, go to the quarterdeck. Ships located at the three private shipyards usually have a special emergency phone that connects directly to their emergency or security office without dialing. In the event of an earthquake, seek cover. If you are inside an office, get away from falling debris by getting under a desk, table, or doorway. If you can, get clear of all buildings, overhead structures, and electrical wiring. Once the shaking has stopped, move into an open area away from any possible debris or overhead wires. Immediately after an earthquake, bomb threat, terrorist alert, or major disaster, you should evacuate the work area. Whether you are in your own facility, at a contractor shipyard or at a naval station location, 
your employer will have a chosen area for employees to meet during an evacuation. You should know where that location is for every job site. The reason to go to a specific meeting site is so that your organization can count every person to determine if anyone is missing. One of the biggest problems in major disaster is accounting for everyone. If no one knows where you are, they will assume that you are trapped somewhere and keep looking for you. Go to your designated location and make sure that your supervisors know that you are safe. Before you leave the site of an evacuation, always make sure they know that you are leaving. Because the shipyard is a tough environment with physical demands, there is a chance that you may receive an injury. Most shipyard injuries are minor, such as cuts, scrapes, dust in the eye, or mild strains. Every employer is responsible to provide medical care for their own employees when they have injuries. If you are injured, tell your supervisor or find a safety representative. They will assist you. Your company will have a first aid kit available either in an office, a tool room, or a vehicle. For minor injuries where a first aid kit is adequate, even if it is just a small cut, you should fill out an accident form the day the injury occurs. Insurance coverage for injuries that are not reported in a timely fashion may be denied later on. Always notify your supervisor and fill out an accident form. Sometimes employees receive a stress or strain injury from heavy lifting, awkward bending, repetitive motions, vibrating equipment, or other actions. Usually these occur over time and get progressively worse. Whenever you have such injury, report it as soon as you notice it. If you strain your back, fill out an accident report. Tell your employer if you are experiencing pain during work so they can help find solutions to relieve the problem. While we do everything we can to prevent them, accidents can happen. Hopefully there won't be any injuries when they do, but even if there are no injuries, accidents still need to be reported. If you have an automobile accident, like bumping a fender in a parking lot, you need to report it. If it involves only personal autos, then it can be handled between the two owners and their insurance companies. If a company vehicle is involved, the company must be notified. The driver of the company vehicle must tell his supervisor or designated company representative and the report will be made. If you are in an auto accident on a naval station, the station police must be notified and they will generate a report. Accidents involving equipment, either in shops or on board ships, should always be reported to your supervisor. Anytime that equipment is damaged, you should stop and report it before you continue. If there are any hazards caused, such as damaged wires or leaking chemicals, be sure to notify your supervisor to eliminate further harm or damage. Knowing what to do in an emergency can help you and those around you. Take action to get help. Seek care and report it right away. Make sure you are accounted for and that your supervisor knows if you leave the site. The shipyard environment has many dangers. Pay attention. Always consider safety first. Preventing an accident is the best protection. Every shipyard and every subcontractor must comply with California regulations that protect the environment. Every employee must take action to contain the environmental hazards, immediately clean up any spills and leaks, and handle hazardous waste in a proper manner. This segment will describe important environmental issues you must be aware of. Check your employer's regulations for complete details. Protecting the environment from shipyard activities starts with good housekeeping. Keeping work sites clean on shore and on ships will significantly reduce the potential environmental harm. Each employee is responsible for ensuring that work areas are clean and that trash and materials do not contribute to pollution of the environment. Any employee responsible to transfer, pump, handle, or store liquids must take steps to prevent spills or leaks. All containers, holding tanks, and vehicles must meet environmental requirements. This also includes their connecting hoses and fittings. Valves and fittings on hoses should have either a protective wrapping or a drip catching device to contain leaks. Containment barriers must be installed under tanks and pump trucks. Special requirements are imposed when hoses are used to transfer over water, including making hose connections leak proof. Never allow any fluids to drip or leak into the surrounding waters. If there is an accidental leak, be sure to stop it immediately and take action to clean it up. 
report it to the Emergency Response Department or Shipyard Hazmat Team. Many locations have spill kits located close to the work site, often at the hazardous material collection site. Notify your supervisor right away to assist you. When the weather is dry, the dirt, dust, and oils in the shipyard may tend to build up on the pavement and in outside areas. When the rain comes, it can wash this hazardous material into the drains. The state of California has strict rules about keeping contaminated rainwater from flowing directly into drains or into San Diego Bay. All of the prime contractors have rainwater storage systems. Many subcontractor facilities also must comply with stormwater protection laws. At any type of facility, it is important that you never dump waste or contaminants into any storm drain. Some drains have filters installed to catch debris and contaminants. This does not make them safe for you to pour your contaminants into them. You must always dispose of waste and hazardous materials through proper waste methods and not into any drain. There are strict air pollution controls in Southern California. Make sure that your cars, trucks, generators, and other equipment do not emit excessive smoke or pollutants into the air. If the exhaust is smoking, shut down the motor and notify your supervisor. If you are operating equipment that is emitting smoky exhaust at a prime contractor facility, they may ask you to shut it down or remove it. Air pollution laws always require that paint and solvent containers are kept closed. Discharging water from bilges, tanks, or containers is not allowed. If you need to remove water from any location on a ship or dry dock, check with your supervisor. Never discharge into the bay or dry dock. The state of California has some of the strictest laws regarding hazardous waste. In addition to controlling hazardous chemicals such as paints, solvents, and oils, we must also properly control disposal of everyday materials such as flashlight batteries, fluorescent light bulbs, and electronic equipment. All of these materials can be hazardous to the environment. Every prime contractor has collection sites for hazardous waste. If you need to dispose of any material or equipment, be sure to take it to one of these sites. The contractor representatives will help you determine how to dispose of your materials. When hazardous wastes are collected for removal, they must only be transported by a licensed has waste hauler. Unless you are licensed, you must never move or transport any hazardous waste of any type. You must also never remove hazardous waste from a prime contractor's yard unless you are a licensed hauler. We all need to follow California environmental laws. These protect us and the environment. Be sure to implement good housekeeping principles, prevent leaks and spills, keep storm drains clean, prevent discharges to the air or water, always bring hazardous waste to the collection sites. If you ever have any questions, always ask your supervisor. Hand and power tools are a vital part of the workplace. Understanding the dangers and knowing how to keep yourself and others safe when using hand and power tools is the focus of our next training. Hand tools can be either powered or non-powered. Some common powered hand tools are grinders, electric drills, sawzalls, needle guns, deck crawlers, and soldering irons. Non-powered hand tools include hammers, files, chisels, and wrenches. Most hand tools are stored in the tool room and must be checked out when you need them, although many employees have some of their own hand tools. Tools that you get from the tool room must be returned when you are done with them so they can be available for others to use. If a tool gets damaged or broken, return it to the tool room and be sure to let them know it needs repair. Larger power tools include welding machines, pipe threaders, band saws, magnetic drills, lathes, milling machines, and press brakes. You can only use these types of power tools if you are trained and authorized to do so. Never use any of these large power tools if you are not authorized. There are safety guidelines for every hand and power tool. Only use a tool for its intended purpose. Always operate equipment according to the manufacturer's guidelines to protect yourself and others from danger. Electrical hand tools receive their power through an electrical cord. Before using them, check that the power cord is not damaged and that it has a safe ground. If any cord is damaged or the ground is missing, you must unplug the equipment immediately and return it to the tool room for repairs. All air-operated equipment must have proper hose connections and a shutoff valve. 
When using Chicago style connectors, be sure they have a pin inserted in each connection to safely keep it together. Many hand and power tools have safety guards to protect users from spinning or moving parts. They are commonly found on grinders and saws and over pulleys and belts. You must never remove any safety guards. If safety guards are missing, return the tool to the tool room for replacement or tag it out of service until it is fixed. Safety switches are found on many power operated tools. You are never allowed to override or remove any safety switch. Also, you are not allowed to lock the tool in the on position by overriding a switch with tape, wire, or other means. Locking a tool in the on position makes it very dangerous to the user. Many tools use a cutting or lubrication fluid. This helps with drilling, cutting, sawing, and cooling. Whenever you use these fluids, be sure to use them as directed. Clean up the mess afterward. Be careful of chemical hazards. If any tool becomes broken, damaged, or it is not operating properly, stop and get it fixed. Do not repair tools yourself unless you are authorized and trained to do so. Take portable hand and power tools to the tool room for repair. You must also be trained and authorized before you can use any large power equipment such as lathes, mills, welders, and pipe threaders. Do not use any of these machines if you are not authorized. When using any hand or power tool, be careful not to wear any loose clothing that could get tangled up. This is especially true around rotating equipment like lathes, drills, and grinders. Many tools create shavings or particles that are hot or sharp. Often these are thrown at high speeds. Always be sure to wear the proper protective equipment such as face shields, gloves, and filter masks. Check your company requirements for PPE. When using hand operated tools that vibrate, wear protective gloves to help shield from the vibration. Vibrations over time can lead to injury. Wearing gloves can help eliminate the harm. Hand and power tools are vital to the shipyard worker. Always be careful when you use them. Make sure they are in good condition. Use them properly. Don't remove safety guards. Get them fixed if they are broken or unsafe. Always wear proper PPE. Be sure to follow all of your employer's rules and guidelines. If you ever have any questions, always ask your supervisor. A fire on board a ship can be a really bad thing. If it gets out of control, a fire can cause millions of dollars in damage and injure or even kill workers. All fires are preventable, which is why you need to know how to stop them. Fires are usually caused by workers performing hot work. Hot work is any work that creates flames, sparks, or heat. This includes welding, burning, or grinding. Before you can do any hot work on board a ship, you must follow these basic rules. Always get a hot work permit. Clear the work area of any flammable or combustible materials. Post fire watches in the area while hot work is being done. If there is any sign of a fire, immediately stop work and put it out. A hot work permit is like a license to do hot work. On board any ship, you are required to have this permit before you start any hot work. The process for getting a hot work permit varies slightly on each vessel and in different yards. Your supervisor will tell you how to get the permit or may have already done it for you. The permit will say where the hot work is allowed. You can only perform hot work in areas that are designated on the permit. The hot work permit must be posted at the location of work. Before you begin, you must also verify that all flammable materials are either removed or protected. This means clearing out any containers of flammable liquids, papers, rags, boxes, or other such material. For materials that cannot be moved, such as carpet or anchored furniture, you must cover them to keep them safe. Oftentimes, a retardant fire cloth may be used. This may be layered with plywood to help protect materials. You should also make sure that all aisles and passageways are clear so there is easy access in and out in case of an emergency. The next step is to position fire watches in the proper locations. Each fire watch must be properly trained and certified. A fire watch must be stationed in any area where there may be a fire hazard. If the hot work is on a bulkhead or deck, there must be a fire watch on each side of it. 
Sometimes it will take several fire watches to cover the affected areas. Welders and burners cannot be their own fire watch. Each fire watch must have no other job to do while hot work is in progress. If any fire watch needs to leave for any reason, all hot work must be stopped until they return. Many workers have a signal to let workers in other spaces know if they are ready, or if there is a problem and that hot work needs to be stopped. Anyone performing hot work must wear the needed PPE. Welders and burners must wear leather gloves and clothing, plus proper face and eye protection. Anyone using gas torches must take special precautions. Whenever you connect your torch, always do a drop test. Open the gas valves and set them to the proper pressure. Then turn them off and watch the gauge for any sign of dropping. If the pressure drops, there is a leak somewhere in the lead or torch. You must find the leak and fix it. Be sure to perform the drop test every time you set up any torch or turn on any tanks. Burners must turn off their gas tanks whenever they go to lunch or at the end of every shift. You must never leave your torch on when you are away from it. In addition, you must disconnect your torch and coil up the leads outside on a weather deck that is open to fresh air at the end of every shift. Lastly, you should always be sure that you have ventilation when working inside any spaces. This will keep smoke from building up and affecting others around you. Because welders and burners are close to the smoke and fumes, they should always wear respiratory protection unless ventilation is adequate. Any hot work may cause a fire. For this reason, you need to follow these guidelines. Always get a hot work permit and follow all permit instructions. Clear the work area of any flammable or combustible materials. Post fire watches in the area while hot work is being done. If there is any sign of a fire, immediately stop work and put it out. Everyone doing hot work must follow these guidelines. If you ever have any questions, always ask your supervisor. There's a lot of work going on in a shipyard. All that work can make for a lot of mess. To make sure that the mess doesn't get out of hand, every worker is expected to keep their job site clean and free of hazards. Whether you work at your own shop, at another company's shipyard, or on board a vessel, you will always be responsible to clean up after yourself. At the end of every shift, give yourself enough time to put away your tools and clean up any mess that was made. Sweep your work area clean of debris and remove your trash. If you are working on board a ship, don't use the ship's trash bins. Your company or the shipyard will provide trash bins for you to use. Also, be sure to keep aisles, passageways, and walkways clear at all times. Don't stack your materials where others need to pass. To keep areas free from too much clutter, only bring to the worksite those materials you are going to use right away. Whenever you run extension cords, hoses, welding leads, and ventilation lines, you must keep them off the deck. In shipyards and on dry docks, they provide trees and hooks to hold your leads above the deck. This will keep them from being trip hazards and will protect them from sharp objects, hot metals, and heavy traffic. In cases where leads must run on the ground, run them through protective steel deck guards that allow the vehicles to safely drive over them. Clean away all flammable or burnable materials before you do any hot work. This is especially important on board ships where fires are common. When working on board ships, be sure to cover equipment and furniture to prevent damage. Whether you are painting, grinding, burning, welding, or just working with dirty shoes, make sure that you protect the carpets, furniture, equipment, and surroundings. You should always store all materials and equipment in a safe and organized manner. Keep materials packed neatly until you need them. Store your tools in a company gang box to keep tools safe. Every worksite will include a place to stage your tools. Be sure to keep them locked to protect them from theft. Most shipyards provide contractors with designated laydown areas to store materials and tools near the worksite. Usually they are very limited in size and must be used wisely. They must also be kept neat and tidy. When repairing ships, there are often cases where shipboard materials are moved and stored for reinstallation after work is complete. This may include furniture, machinery, ducting, or other equipment. Whenever shipboard materials are removed and stored, they must be properly protected from damage. Also, they must be tagged with a label for identification. 
Once tagged, they must be moved to a laydown area or a designated storage location. Ask your supervisor for more directions on properly tagging and storing these materials. Scrap material that are permanently removed from ships must be recycled or reused. Check with your supervisor for how to manage routing of material off of ships. There are usually bins for scrap steel, aluminum, brass, and other materials. Government equipment permanently removed from any military ship must be forwarded to a government supply center. You must follow proper methods when disposing of all hazardous materials. These include things like spray cans, solvent containers, dirty rags, empty oil cans, fluorescent light bulbs, batteries, contaminated gloves, and many other materials. You must never place any hazardous waste material in the regular garbage. You must also never remove hazardous waste from a shipyard. If you are not sure if your waste is hazardous, always check with your supervisor. Shipyards are a very busy place. Being messy makes the job harder for everyone. Keeping things clean is necessary. Always clean up at the end of your shift. Don't leave your mess for the next person. Organize your materials. Protect furniture and equipment from damage. Properly dispose of your waste and debris. Keeping the yard clean requires your daily effort. There is a potential safety hazard from any equipment or device that operates using energy. This energy may be electrical energy found in energized wirings, motors, and fixtures, mechanical energy found in elevators, winches, hatches, and doors, hydraulic or pneumatic energy found in piping, pumps, and actuators, chemical energy found in fuels, reactive agents, and toxic chemicals. If you do any repair or maintenance on equipment while it is still energized, that energy is a serious hazard that could injure or even kill you. To prevent this danger, energy operated equipment must be shut down and either locked out or tagged out of use to prevent it from being turned on while you are working. This training will show you what you need to know to work safely when energy hazards are present. Every work site has a written lockout tagout procedure. The procedure may be somewhat different on each ship and in each shipyard, but the purpose is always the same. To make sure that before repairing or maintaining any equipment, it is shut down and the hazardous energy removed. To keep the energy from being turned back on, the system is either locked or tagged at its control points after being shut down. These locks or tags are installed to prevent everyone from re-energizing this system while repairs are in progress. As long as all locks and tags are in place, workers are protected. All of the actual locking out and tagging out of any system is performed only by specially trained and authorized people. Unless you are specially trained and authorized to do so, you will not perform the actual lockout or tag out of any equipment. However, you will be required to obey all of the lockout tag out rules for production workers. Every employee must follow three basic rules in the lockout tag out procedure. Do not work on any energized system. Never operate any locked out or tagged out device. And do not re-energize any system without following the proper lockout tag out procedure to tag the system in. If you are working on board a ship, your supervisor will be responsible to request tag outs and energized equipment. Before you go to work, be sure to check that systems are properly tagged out of service. On military ships, most tags are red in color. This is why it is often called red tagged when a system is tagged out. However, tags may also be yellow, white, or some other color. No matter what the type or color is, every tag means that the system is tagged out and must not be operated. In some cases, a lock may be placed on a system to ensure that it is not operated. Sometimes there will only be a lock, other times only a tag, and sometimes there will be both. Either one or both combined always means the same thing. Do not operate the equipment. Violating a lockout or tagout can result in severe penalties, including suspension or termination. The lockout and tagout requirements also apply in shops and offices. Your employer will have a procedure for how you must handle lockouts and tagouts in your own company location. When you are working at your employer's facility, 
there is an additional requirement. Anytime that you find energized yard equipment that is defective, in need of repair, or unsafe to operate, you should immediately turn that equipment off to protect yourself. Place a warning tag or barrier on it to prevent others from using it. You must also notify your supervisor or the maintenance department right away. If you work at an off-site location, you must never operate any equipment that is tagged out of service. Notify your supervisor if there are any questions about services. Energy in the workplace can be very dangerous. Following these three basic rules will keep you safe from dangerous energy hazards. Never work on any energized system. Never operate any locked out or tagged out device. And do not re-energize any system without following the proper lockout tag out procedure. If you ever have any questions, always ask your supervisor or safety representative. Work in a shipyard can be tough and dangerous. There are sparks, dust, falling debris, noise, and many other hazards. For your protection, you will be required to wear personal protective equipment. This equipment, often called PPE, may include hard hats, safety glasses, earplugs, gloves, harnesses, welding hoods, respirators, or other safety devices. This course will help train you on what PPE to wear and when and how to wear it. For complete details, see your employer's written procedures. When you come to work in the shipyard, you must dress properly. This means wearing long pants that cover your legs and a shirt that covers your shoulders. Avoid wearing man-made fibers such as nylon, rayon, or polyester. Heavy cotton or denim works well. Hard hats and safety glasses are required at all times whenever you are on board any ship or inside any contractor or government shipyard. You are not required to wear them as you are coming into or leaving work or inside offices, but at all times during working hours, you are required to wear them in the production environment. For foot protection, it is mandatory that workers wear shoes or boots with hard soles and leather uppers. For production workers, they should have a substantial rise in order to protect the ankle and also have some type of a pronounced heel. This will keep you from slipping on steep ladders. Your employer may also require steel-toed shoes or boots. Open toe sandals and ordinary tennis shoes are never allowed. Welders or burners should wear leathers during hot work. This may be leather sleeves, jackets, chaps, or pants as needed. Welders should always be sure that no part of their skin is exposed to the light of the welding arc as this will cause arc burn. Welders and burners must also tie back long hair or wear it under a cap to avoid having it catch on fire. Damage to the eye is one of the most common injuries in the shipyard. As stated earlier, you must wear safety glasses at all times. In shops and on piers, safety glass lenses may be either clear or color shaded. However, when working aboard ships, colored lenses are not allowed. Eye protection for welders consists of using a special lens inside of an approved welding hood. When using a welding hood, you should also wear safety glasses underneath for the times when your hood is raised. Eye protection for burning or brazing requires burning goggles or a shaded face shield. Burning goggles may be darker than a number 3 lens, but should not be used for work in ambient light. When working around hazardous liquids, eye protection goggles are available. Goggles may be worn over prescription glasses. When working around welders, there is a danger of flash burn from the welding arc. To avoid flash burn, never look directly at any welding arc. Also, avoid welding light reflected off of walls and equipment. Even exposure from the side can be harmful. Noise levels on ships and in shipyards are often very high. Loud noise, especially for long periods, can cause permanent hearing loss. Whenever the noise levels are high, you must wear hearing protection. In many locations, you will be alerted by signs signaling that hearing protection must be worn. But even if there are no signs, you must wear hearing protection whenever you are working around loud noise. To protect your hearing, disposable earplugs are readily available on board ships and in shipyards. They can normally be found in tool rooms or at entries to machinery spaces. Additional hearing protection is provided by wearing earmuffs. These are bulky but provide excellent ear protection when worn correctly. 
Wear them the same way you would wear headphones, making sure to seal around the ear for complete protection. In many shipyard operations, there are high levels of dust, fumes, paint, smoke, toxic chemicals, or other hazards that may be breathed. These respiratory hazards will often require you to wear respiratory protection. There are different types of filter masks and respirators for different uses. Your supervisor will explain which respirator is best for you. There are several types of gloves available to protect your hands. Basic hand protection is provided by either a cotton or leather work glove. There are also three basic types of rubber gloves. These include a heavy rubber glove for extremely harsh chemicals and acids, a medium weight glove designed for solvents and cleaning chemicals, and a lightweight glove for working with paint, grease, and dirty equipment. For hand protection during welding operations, a heavy leather glove with protective lining must be used. Welders must wear these gloves during welding operations in order to protect against the high heat and sparks of the welding process. Burners and brazers using torches should use either a heavy or medium weight leather glove. This will help protect from sparks, flames, and heated metals. Life jackets are mandatory when you are working over water, such as in boats, on floats, or alongside piers. The life jacket is designed to keep you afloat even if you are knocked unconscious. It must be fastened securely and completely to ensure proper function. Fall protection is a tether device that is worn to catch you if you fall from a high place. This is mandatory for any worker who is working in areas higher than 5 feet where there is no protection such as railings or life nets. It is also mandatory for anyone working in a man lift. The best fall protection is a full body harness, but in some cases a safety belt may be used. The lanyard of the harness or belt is attached to a hook or solid structure in the work area that will be sturdy enough to hold you in case you fall. Your supervisor will show you how to properly wear a harness or safety belt. Special jobs may require special equipment. If you are assigned to perform a job that requires special PPE not described here, you must be given instruction on how to properly use it on your job. There will be additional special training provided to painters, abatement workers, and anyone who must use special personal protective equipment. Proper use of PPE will protect your health and safety. Always wear the right equipment to keep you safe and protected. If there is ever any doubt about your protection, check with your supervisor or the safety department. Most contractors work on board military vessels, meaning Navy, Military Sea Lift Command, MSC, and Coast Guard. This segment covers important things to know when working on any military vessel. The gangway onto a military vessel is called the brow, and where you walk on board is a station called the quarterdeck. This is where the ship security personnel will check your company badge or personal identification before allowing you to board. Remember that military personnel take security very seriously. Every morning and evening, military vessels always observe what is called colors. This means raising or lowering the United States flag. All of the sailors will stop what they are doing and salute towards the stern of their ship, which is where the flagpole is located. It is appropriate for civilian contractors to stop and remain silent during these ceremonies. Military vessels have a space numbering system to help you find your way. Each space has what is referred to as a tack number, which includes a deck number, a frame number, and a side number. The deck numbering always starts with the main deck as number one, the next deck as number two, then three, and so on. For all decks above the main deck, the numbering begins with zero, pronounced O, and goes from O1 to O2, O3, O4, and so on. The second number in the designation is the frame number. Frames are like the ribs of the ship and numbering begins at the bow with the frame number one. An aircraft carrier has over 260 frames. The third number tells where the space is located relative to the center line. Zero means that the space is in the center of the ship. Odd numbers are used on the starboard side, which is the right side, and even numbers are used on the port side, the left side. Navy vessels often include a designator which is a letter that stands for the type of space. At any time you are on board a military vessel, they may perform a drill. This is how the ship's force will practice for emergencies and they may have them every day. 
If you are in a passageway or walkway when a team responds to a drill, always step back and give them plenty of room to pass. If there is a real emergency, you must also stay back and may be asked to leave the area of the ship. Sometimes you may be working aboard a military vessel while sailors are living aboard. In the sailors' living quarters, there will be heads and showers as well as berthing areas. You should avoid entering these private areas when they are occupied by members of the opposite sex. If your work assignment requires you to enter these areas, always announce your presence before entering to give others a heads up. Man on deck! Man on deck! Coming in! On board all Navy vessels, there is a requirement that any crew going to work must first receive an approved work authorization form, or WAF, for the ship. This WAF is basically a work permit. Your supervisor will obtain this WAF permit for you and it must be posted at the job site. Be sure to read all the instructions and restrictions of the WAF before you begin. Most military vessels have what are called fire zone boundaries. A fire zone boundary is a bulkhead that runs all the way through the ship and is used as a boundary in the event of a fire. The doorways on these bulkheads are marked with signs and often have small red stripes around their outer perimeter. Running a hose or lead through these doors will prevent them from being closed in an emergency. For this reason, you must get a permit and then make sure you include quick disconnect fittings on every hose or lead run through the fire zone boundary. The quick disconnect must be placed within 10 feet of the door and must also have a shutoff valve to allow sailors to turn off any lines and disconnect them quickly if they have to close the door in an emergency. Airlines must have a shutoff valve or automatic quick disconnect. Fluid lines must have a valve on each side of the quick disconnect so they won't leak when disconnected. Your supervisor will help you get the permit and show you how to set up disconnects. On board military vessels, there are spaces that have restricted access. These will have signs posted on the doorways. You must never enter any restricted area. If you do, even by accident, you will be detained by security personnel. Navy vessels have areas that are designated for the officers, called officer country. Signs are posted on the doorways, and the floors in them are usually blue in color. You should stay out of these areas unless you have work to do inside them. The international sign for the radiation warning is a magenta propeller in a yellow background. The radiation barrier is a tape that is also yellow and magenta. These signs and the colored barrier tape are a signal that radiation is present. They are used whenever x-ray radiography is being done and also on nuclear power ships. Radiation is a serious hazard and you must always stay outside of any areas posted with these signs or barriers. There is never an exception to this rule. Working on board military vessels adds extra requirements. Always be sure that you follow all security guidelines and be aware of your responsibilities. Know the ship's routines including colors, drills, and privacy in living quarters. On Navy vessels, make sure that you have a WAF before beginning work. Always read the WAF restrictions and follow the guidelines. Get a permit for every lead that you run through a fire zone boundary and make sure they have quick disconnects. Stay out of all restricted areas. Never cross radiation barriers. If you have any questions when working on board military vessels, always ask your supervisor. Shipyards can be active, crowded places to work. There is busy traffic with people and materials moving all about. Stairways, dry docks, cranes, forklifts, heavy equipment, trucks, and lots of other activity mean that you will need to be very careful when working in any shipyard. This video will show you some of the basic shipyard rules. Consult your employer's requirements for complete details. Shipyards always have cranes. Some of these are small and some may be very large. All of them can be dangerous. This is what you need to know about crane safety. Never walk under any crane load. Loads can fall and you don't want to be under it if it does. Stand back when crane loads move overhead. Crane operators will alarm you, often by sounding a horn when they are moving loads overhead. When you hear the warning, look to make sure you are not in the way. Move back if you need to. Crane tracks must be kept clear at all times. 
you must never park vehicles or place materials inside the painted lines of crane tracks. Only authorized people can operate a crane. If you are not authorized to operate a crane, even a small one, don't run it. Ask your supervisor for direction. In yard areas and on ships and piers, riggers signal the cranes. They will direct crane operations and blow whistles to help warn against dangers. Shipyard workers must obey the safety direction of riggers. Shipyards have people and vehicles all moving around together. If you drive any type of vehicle in the shipyard, you must obey all traffic signs. This includes speed limit signs, stop signs, and caution signs. Be aware that there are lots of different vehicles including trucks, bicycles, yard crawlers, forklifts, man lifts, and many others. When walking or riding bicycles, be very careful around train tracks and other obstacles. These can be a trip hazard. Bicycles have an extreme hazard as tires can get caught in rail tracks. Vehicles must always yield to pedestrians, especially at shift change. Some yards even require that vehicles stop during lunch and shift changes to protect pedestrians. Only park in designated areas. Trucks with special equipment are sometimes allowed on the work site, but they must be properly parked and kept out of the way of traffic. You must never operate any man lift, scissor lift, or forklift unless you are properly trained and authorized to do so. You must be specially trained and licensed to run this type of equipment. Platform scaffolds are commonly used in shipyards. Scaffolding must comply with strict OSHA requirements. For this reason, only authorized people can install and maintain scaffolds. Before a scaffold can be used, it must be approved. This will be indicated by a tag or certification. Look for an approved tag or certification before using any scaffold. If there is a red tag or no certification, do not use the scaffold. You must never alter or repair any scaffold. Only properly trained people can make repairs and changes. Immediately notify your supervisor if you find any scaffold that is unsafe or needs changes. Deck openings, high surfaces, and other fall hazards must have safety railings installed. These railings must be sturdy enough and high enough to prevent accidental falls. If you find an unsafe scaffold, ladder, stairway, or opening, let your supervisor know immediately. Put up a barrier and a sign if there may be others who could be injured. There are lots of materials moving in, out, and around shipyards. Keep control of all the materials you are responsible for. Store them neatly and out of the way. Protect them from damage. Use pallets when possible. This makes it easy to move them with forklifts and cranes. Put identification tags or markers on all materials. Your supervisor will explain the requirements for material tagging. You may be given a laydown area to place your materials and tools. Use this wisely and be sure to keep these areas clean. Shipyards are an active workplace. Be sure to pay attention to cranes and overhead loads, yard traffic including vehicles and pedestrians, scaffold, stairway and fall hazards, controlling your materials and tools. Your safety depends on you to always be on guard for dangers in the shipyard. <laughs>